today. The Feast of St. Stephen, the first martyr, and the day after Christmas. We'll be back again in Toronto. And just a few considerations. So the epistle for this Feast of St. Stephen is taken from the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 6. In those days, Stephen, full of grace and power, was working great wonders and signs among the, among the people. But there, were, there arose some from the synagogue, which is called that of the freedmen, and of the, of the Chirinians, Chirinians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and the province of Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to withstand the wisdom and the spirit who spoke. Now as they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed their teeth at him. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing to the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and rushed upon him all together. And they cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a man, young man named Saul. And while they were stoning Stephen, he prayed and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Lord, do not lay this sin against them. And with these words, he fell asleep in, in, in the Lord and in the Gospel. <clears throat> Taken from that according to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 23. At that time, Jesus said to the scribes and the Pharisees, Therefore, behold, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you will put to death and crucify and some you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, that upon you may come all the just blood that has been shed on the earth, from the blood of Abel, the just, unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Arachius, whom you killed between the temple and the altar. And may I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Thou who killest the prophets, and stonest those who were sent to thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen gathers her young under her wings, but thou wouldest not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall not see me henceforth, until you shall say, Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Thus far the words of the day's holy God. <coughs> Father and Son of the Ghost, Amen. This first day of feast after Christmas, the feast of St. Stephen, the proto-martyr, the very first martyr, and the very first fruit of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And a few considerations today on, says in the last words of the Gospel today, El dormibus, el dormibus in Domino, he fell asleep in the Lord. What happened the day that Stephen went to heaven? When we consider the battle, or the day in which Stephen would enter the kingdom of heaven, he'll be the first, remember Dismas of course entered heaven, but Dismas was a thief, and Dismas lived a wicked life, and then Dismas repented on his deathbed. And Dismas said, Remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. And our Lord said, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it was a very beautiful day, the day of the death of, of Dismas, because he was saved and he entered into heaven. But it was not as magnificent as the day of the death of Stephen. St. Stephen changed the whole history of the world. He was one of the seven deacons. There were only seven deacons, 70 to the original hierarchy of the church. God made the Pope, who was St. Peter, 
and another eleven bishops, the apostles, seventy-two disciples, the priests, and seven deacons. And he chose that of this hierarchy, the deacon was the lowest, but of the hierarchy it would be the deacon, the lowly deacon Stephen, who would change the history of the world. And he would be the first one to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he would be the first one to open the gates, to see the opening of the gates of the kingdom of heaven. So only a few weeks, only a very short time after the day of Pentecost, Stephen was there in the temple, the deacon. One of the duties of the deacon is to preach. He cannot celebrate the holy sacrifice of the mass. He cannot hear confessions. But he can preach. He can speak the word of God. He carries the word of God. The reason is because the deacon is the one who carries the blessed sacrament. During the holy sacrifice of the mass, there should always be a deacon and a subdeacon. And when the priest, because there's no deacon at mass, when we celebrate a low mass or a mass without a deacon and subdeacon, we do the duties of the priest, but we also do the duties of the deacon because there's no deacon present. We also do the duties of the subdeacon because there's no subdeacon present, and no one can take the place of the deacon except for another deacon, and a priest is also a deacon. And no one can take the place of the subdeacon except for another subdeacon, and the priest is also a subdeacon, therefore he fulfills the duties of the deacon and the subdeacon during the holy sacrifice of the mass, as well as his own duty of priest. And the deacon is simply the one that moves. All he does is move the Blessed Sacrament. That is his sacred duty. When the tabernacle is, the Lord is in the tabernacle, the priest steps back, and the deacon opens the tabernacle. The deacon reaches in and takes out the tabarium. The deacon places it upon the, upon the, upon the, the carpel. During the time of the consecration, when there are uh, toasts to be consecrated in the tabarium, the deacon stands in the middle of the consecration and he picks up the, the lid off of the, off of the top of the ciborium that the priest might see into the ciborium when he's consecrating the hosts. And then he puts the lid back onto the ciborium. He then takes the ciborium and places it in the tabernacle. He takes the ciborium out of the tabernacle. He simply moves the blessed sacrament. He cannot confect it. He cannot make Christ present. He simply moves it. And St. Stephen, being of the first deacons, he had the power to move Christ. To carry Christ. That's why the, one of the duties of the deacon is to preach. Because how do we carry Christ to souls? The main way that we carry Christ to souls is by preaching the gospel. By telling them about heaven. And carrying Christ from heaven to the earth. And carrying souls from earth to heaven. And St. Stephen therefore fulfilled this most beautiful duty of deacon. When he stood in front of all those enemies of God from various places. The Alexandrians and the Chilicians and the Cyrenians. All these Jews from various places, and they hated Stephen, and they contended with Stephen, and he stood by himself against all these men, all of whom hated God, all of whom couldn't stand the New Testament. All were filled with venom and hate, and they argued against Stephen, and he confounded them, and he defeated them in argument. And it says, and the, the Acts of the Apostles tells us, and they gnashed their teeth, and they were filled with anger. They were very angry because he defeated them in argument. But that isn't what got them. That isn't what made them kill Stephen. They were upset that Stephen defeated them in argument. But it wasn't enough to make them want to kill him. They were angry. But in the midst of the argument, Stephen then looked up to heaven. And he saw the clouds of heaven opened. And he said, Behold, I see the clouds of heaven opened. And I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And this is what caused them to become angry beyond all imagination. This is what made them feel their hate go overboard. And therefore they stopped up their ears. And they began to scream with a loud voice, lest they hear Stephen continue to speak. And with great haste they grabbed him. And they brought him out of the temple. And they stoned him to death. And they laid their cloaks at the feet of a most wicked Pharisee, a young man who devoted his life to the destruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And his name was Saul of Tarsus. And they put their cloaks in front of him. And this was the day in which the scripture tells us it was the day that Stephen fell asleep. It was the day that he slept with the Lord it was a day of peace. It was a day of joy. It was a day of wonder. It was a day of magnificence. 
But when you look at the souls that were there that day, they didn't think it was wonderful. There were the friends of Stephen who wept that he was being killed. <clears throat> there were the enemies of Stephen who rejoiced that he was finally being killed. And there was turmoil, and there was noise, and there was darkness, and there was hate, and there was sin, and there was evil. But what does the scripture tell us? And what do the saints tell us every morning when we read in the office of pride? The, the, the martyrology is read every morning in the office of pride, and the reader goes out, the lector goes out, and he reads about the days in which the saints slept. The day they took a nap, the day they rested, the day that their life was taken away, vita mutator non tolitur, their life was changed and not taken away. Dismas had a beautiful death because he converted, but his death was nothing compared to the death of, the, of, of Stephen and the death of the martyrs, which is the most wonderful of all possible deaths, because it is the death that is likened to the day in which our Lord said these words to his father, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirits. What do we discover about the death of the saints? It is the death of a man. A man sees his goal. He knows what his goal is. And he goes to his goal. And when he is on his way to his goal, there may be those that block him. Those that attack him. Those that try to stop him from achieving the goal. And he will not be stopped. He will not be distracted. He will not turn along the way. He will go to his goal. And what is the goal of Stephen? It is to see Christ face to face. And on this day, he sees him. It is to rest in the Lord. And on this day, he rests in the Lord. And he saw the gates of heaven opened. And he saw the Son of Man stand at the right hand of God. And his final words were, Lord, do not lay up this sin to their charge. And what happened because of Stephen? Because of this deacon who preached a total of one sermon in his life. Many deacons, priests are also deacons, we preach thousands of sermons. He preached only one. Only one sermon. That's all he ever preached. And that sermon changed the whole history of the world. After he preached a sermon that was so powerful that it caused the enemies of God to stamp out his voice and to wipe him out. And so they did. And he said one prayer, one very short prayer. Father, do not lay up the sin to these people's charge. And he heard the prayer. And he looked down upon the crowd and saw all the wicked Cyrenians and all the wicked Alexandrians and all the wicked Jews that were there. And he saw the most wicked of them all, who had the most wicked heart, who was the most filled with maliciousness, who took to himself every stone, who took to himself all the wickedness. As St. Augustine tells us, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was not only wicked, he was most wicked. He had the, he had the hatred of Christ deep and deep into the core of his blood. And though his hatred was great, and though his sin was powerful, and though he was filled with the greatest maliciousness of heart, he was no match for Stephen. Stephen simply said, Lay not up this sin to their charge. And therefore the father heard St. Stephen. And he found the most wicked of all those men that were there that day, and he made him the apostle to the Gentiles. He made him bring about more conversions than every other saint, any other saint. He was the one who brought about the greatest conversion to Christ in all the world. The greatest of all the apostles was formed that day. And the scripture tells us, Saul tells us, I have released the apostles because I persecuted the church of God. But his grace in me has not been void. And he is greater than Peter, greater than St. John, greater than all the other, the other 12 apostles. He was born out of due time. How did he become so great? Where did it come from? It came from the prayer and the blood of St. Stephen, and it transformed the whole world. And therefore, when we go and visit this day, the day in which the Cyrenians hated Christ, the Alexandrians hated Christ, all the Jews hated Christ, and they said, we are going to destroy this Christ. We don't care that he rose from the dead. We know he rose from the dead. We know he did these miracles on Pentecost. We know that his disciples, Peter and John, are performing miracles and raising the sick 
Silver and gold I have, I, I have not, but, but of what I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and walk. They saw the miracles. They saw the resurrection. They had all the evidence, but their hearts were hardened. And they became more and more hardened. And we have reading in the, in the gospel today, our Lord says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Behold, I'm going to step away from thee. And how long is he going to step away? Is that a big, so that in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stones those that were sent to thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, says our Lord, as a hen gathers her young under her wings, but thou wouldest not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. Here comes the curse of God. The Jewish house is left desolate. It was left desolate on this day that St. Stephen, St. Stephen preached a sermon, and he gave the last chance to the Jews to really accept the truth. They had seen Christ rise from the dead. They had seen all the miracles of St. Peter and St. John, and now Stephen contends with them, and they hate him, and they bring him to death. Therefore, their house is left desolate for 2,000 years. For I say to you, you shall not see me henceforth. That's the real curse of the Jews. Remember they said on Good Friday, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And so, you shall not see me henceforth. For I say to you, you shall not see me henceforth until you shall say, Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. What's going to happen one day? One day the Jews shall say the words. The first part of the prophecy is in under fulfillment right now. They are a house desolate. There is emptiness in the Jewish world. They are desolate. They are a house that's empty, and Christ has not visited them, and they see him not. But until the day comes that the Jewish people will say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they will say it. They will. They will say it at the end of times. They will repent. They will convert. As it says in the book of Joel in the Old Testament, and as it says in multiple other places, and as Christ himself says right here in the Gospel of St. Matthew, he says, there will come a time. And when, when, so what is it that makes the world tick? What is it that God looks at in the world? He looks only at goodness. He looks only at truth. And goodness and truth, what they are, in reality, they are identical. We learned in philosophy. They are identical. Goodness and truth are the same. They are only different in that good is related to my heart, True is raised in my mind. But in reality, they're the same thing. And when good and true come together, we call this beauty. And the world that God created is beautiful. And the world that he created is good. And the world that he created is true. And he looks upon the true. He's waiting for the truth and the goodness to come back to the heart of the Jews. That's what he's waiting for. And then he will forget all the sins. He will forget them all. And this is going to happen at the end of the world. And through the preaching of Enoch and Elias, and the final priests of the end times, the Jews shall repent as a people. Individual Jews have repented many times in the last 2,000 years, but always small in number. But they shall repent as a people. And they shall say as a people, Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. And when the Lord hears that one word, he shall forget all the murders, all the crucifixions. And he says, what you're going to do in the future, you will crucify. You know, many times in the last 2,000 years, Jews have crucified the followers of Christ. Many times. There was a famous trial in the 1200s where about 30 Jews got together and they took a 12-year-old boy and they captured him on Holy Thursday. And they underwent the entire passion with that boy. They took the boy and they put him on trial. And they threw him in the well. And they scourged him. And they crowned him with thorns. And they nailed him to the cross at noon. They pierced him with a lance and killed him and underwent the entire crucifixion. Every part of it. The trials of every part. Killing that boy who now is a martyr in the kingdom of heaven. And there are many others that have crucified in a similar manner. And of course the crucifixion of St. Peter. And the crucifixion of St. Andrew. And he said, you will crucify many of the prophets that will still come to you. You will scourge them. You will cast them, you will drive them from town to town. And Saul of Tarsus, when he converted and became St. Paul, he had to flee from town to town. And many of our ancestors had to flee from town to town. 
And so it will always be until the end of times. But what's going to be the conclusion? We are all waiting for that day when those people that brought about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And look at St. Stephen. He is there in a world that despises God. He is in a world that hates him and does not want to repent. And what does he see? He sees the beauty of heaven. He sees the magnificence of God. He sees the wonder of the faith. And he is not afraid. And he is filled with great joy and great peace. And he is not disturbed. And hence the day in which they take him violently out. It is a day of violence for them. It is not a day of violence for him. And the day they stone him, they have blood upon their hands, but he has no blood upon his. And in great peace and great joy, he passes and falls asleep in the Lord. And his life is changed, and he goes to the kingdom of heaven. And through St. Stephen, Saul of Tarsus is converted. Through St. Stephen, we know also a final prophecy that matches the prophecy of the Old Testament. Because remember what our Lord said. I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And in the Old Testament, it says the Gentiles shall convert. The Gentiles shall come to God. And the Jews shall one day turn against him. But it also says, but they shall repent. Now God told to Ezekiel, I shall drop you upon your knees, and you shall be forced upon your knees and call me the Lord. And so they shall be repentant at the end of time. And this is, the, this is the prophecy of the Old Testament. And Stephen fulfills, repeats the prophecy right before he dies. He knows it's going to happen. And our Lord repeats the prophecy in Matthew 23. And he talks about the end of time. Jerusalem, I'm waiting for the day to you to come. To say, blessed is the name of the Lord. And when we consider the wickedness of our age, what is God doing right now? He is seeing the world filled with homosexuality, filled with abortion, filled with the denial of all the dogmas of his faith, filled with every manner of sin. The world is trying to attack and destroy all that remains of Christianity, all the reigns of his kingdom, and the wickedness is bounding and bounding, increasing and increasing. But what is Christ seeing? He sees a soul that is now hating him. But if he only says, Blessed be the name of the Lord, he will forget all his sins. He sees the souls of our world filled in darkness, but he does not pay attention to the darkness. He sees rather the light. He sees that these souls of this world, they are going to be repentant. They are going to be pulled back to him. They are going to be give, give him glory again. And they shall give him glory. Remember also, not only do the just give glory to God, but the damned also give glory to God. No one escapes his glory. The damned give him glory by showing forth his justice. The damned give him glory by showing forth the justice of God as he breathes a torrent of fire upon them. But they give him glory. They also show forth his mercy because he doesn't make them suffer as much as they should. It is their suffering does not equal the wickedness of their sins. They suffer less than they should. And therefore he shows his mercy in hell. And he shows his justice in hell because they do suffer eternally as they must suffer eternally. And his glory is there in hell. And his glory is on earth. And his glory is in the heavens. And his glory is forever. And it shall not be stopped. And then also, as St. Thomas tells us about the nature of evil, remember that evil is only an absence. It's just something missing. And we shouldn't spend our time thinking about things that are missing. It's just an absence of an odd good, is the way we define it in philosophy. It's just an absence of an odd good. A, a table has four legs, it's missing one. It has, still has three legs. It's a shame that it's missing one, but it still has three legs. It still has a top. The evil is just the absence of that fourth leg. And the evil also, says St. Thomas, is only in the table. The evil is only in the thing. It's not a universal reality. Whereas good is universal. Good spreads itself. But evil is only in a particular place. That's why at the end of the world, when all the souls of the damned are burning in the midst of the earth in the fires of hell, and all the souls of the, all the angels of the, of the devils are burning in hell, and all their wickedness is burning in hell, not one stain of it, not one little drop of it, not one reminder of all that evil shall be on this earth. 
There shall be a new heaven and a new earth. Because evil is localized. It doesn't, it cannot, it cannot have a universal existence. It's just that bad table, that bad soul, that bad angel who's called a devil. When they, all of them are cast into hell, it's forgotten. And those who have committed sins in their lives but are repentant, though the sin is wiped away, and there's only goodness in all of the souls who are in the kingdom of heaven. And St. Stephen sees, he opens his eyes, and this temporary, this evil of this wicked crowd, it's temporary. And we must remember the evil of the 20th and 21st century, the evil of the wicked governments of our times, the evil of the wickedness of what's going on in Rome today, the evil of the dioceses, the evil in our families, the evil everywhere in the world, it's temporary. It shall all pass. Because our Lord himself said, heaven and earth shall pass, but my word shall not pass. How many wicked words has Christ spoken? None. How many wicked words are in the sacred scripture? None. Wickedness is not of God, and therefore it must pass. What God speaks is permanent. What God speaks remains. And that is why, as we're in this particular battle of our little resistance against Vatican II and modernism happening in the society of Pius X, happening inside of Rome, happening in all the world around us, as the world gets more wicked, as the devil gets more and more control over the laws, as there's more and more efforts to bring souls away from God, we know these efforts shall all fail. 100% failure. There shall be no success. And also as a little litmus test, whenever you see an evil man speak of success, you know that he's not the most evil of men. Because the most evil of men, the ones who truly follow Satan perfectly, they know that they can never succeed. They know they will never have victory, and hence you will never hear them speak of it. You only speak of evil, but never of victory. Those that are smaller and evil and don't understand this, who are still deceived by the devil and not fully corrupted, they will sometimes speak of victory. But the truly wicked shall never speak of it. And so likewise on the flip side, those that are truly just shall never speak of defeat, because we can never be defeated. The devil can never win. And if we are faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ, we can never lose. Remember the great words of St. Joan of Arc, who never learned how to read. She never learned how to read. But she stood in front of priests and bishops <laughs> and great theologians. And they asked her, your voices said you will have victory. Where is your victory? How can you have victory? You're in prison. How can you have victory? You're condemned by the church. How can you have victory? You have wicked voices inside of you. How can you have victory? What is your victory? And she says, my martyrdom. Those priests, unless they repented, are now burning in hell and shall be forgotten forever. But Joan the maid shall never be forgotten. Joan the maid still has her glory right now, and it shall always be her glory, and shall never be taken away, and her victory is forever. In their very brief time torturing her, their very brief time putting her to be burned at the stake, their very brief time of wickedness, it shall be forgotten. And when we are carveling in the new heaven and the new earth, St. Stephen saw that. Why be distracted by a few thousand people that are trying to kill you? Why be distracted by a few thousand people that hate God? By a few thousand people that want your death? By a few thousand people that want to destroy every good? Let them pass. Don't be distracted. But go to the goal. And let nothing distract us along the way. We are here to give glory to God. And it cannot be stopped. We are here to spread His kingdom. And it cannot be stopped. Men of Lord Jesus Christ is born as a baby in Bethlehem. Yes, there were 500 boys who were killed shortly after his birth. Jerusalem was unhappy that the king was there. And he had to flee into the very land of the center of wickedness. All wickedness comes from Egypt. Satanism comes from Egypt. It is a most wicked place. And there he had to flee. He had to flee to Egypt. And he found more comfort and safety in Egypt than he found in Jerusalem. What has happened to the wickedness of the Jewish people that there was more safe in Egypt than he was in Jerusalem? But he came back. 
And he comes back for victory. And here our Lord Jesus Christ says, it's only a few days before his crucifixion that he says these words. Yes, Jerusalem, you are turning against me. And for 2,000 years you shall try to destroy my church. But you shall not succeed. My church shall stand. And furthermore, O oh Satan, you have tried to deceive the Jewish people. You shall fail also. Because the Jews who are my chosen people, they shall repent. They shall convert. They shall stand up against the Antichrist. They shall be faithful to me in the end. They shall say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Elias shall convert them. And Enoch shall convert them. And the final priest at the end of the world shall convert them. And Satan's defeat shall be complete. There will be no place in which Satan can say, Well, I failed with the Gentiles, but I succeeded with the Jews. He did not succeed in anything. He is a complete failure. His evil shall remain forgotten with him eternally in hell. And that baby that was born in Bethlehem, who gave the strength of Stephen to see the beauty of his kingdom. And when we are wives, what will we see? Yes, it's a most wicked world, and we must condemn its wickedness. There is evil around us, and we must try to lead souls away from it. But what must we see? We must see the goodness and the beauty of God, and the goodness and beauty of everything that He is, and everything that He does, and everything that He has done. He is the most magnificent God who is our God, and He only considers magnificence, and He only considers goodness. Consider these words of our Lord Jesus Christ, this people that mocked him, this people that crucified him, this people that despised him, this people that wanted his kingdom to be destroyed after he had given them nothing but goodness. Should he not say, you must do great repentance, you must do great penance, you must prove to me that you are sincere, prove to me that you are worthy of my forgiveness? No, he doesn't say that. He simply says, henceforth you shall never see me. Until you say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And here's one of the points of St. Augustine and many of the saints. Christ is very good, very powerful, and very stable, except when it comes to one thing. He's not good at punishing. There are many cases, for instance, that we mentioned from time to time, one of the saints of the Middle Ages, we forget his name, when God appeared to the saint and said to a young man in the monastery, This man is damned. He is too wicked. He is damned. He is going to be lost. So the man came to the saint and he said, I want to join him. I no, you are damned. You are lost. Get away from me. You are damned. You are damned. And the man wept and said, no, let me be in your monastery. He says, no, get away from me. Well, at least don't, I will not leave you until you say I'm not damned. He says, get away from me. You are damned. And finally, Christ came and appeared to the saint and said, tell the man to leave me alone. I've changed my mind. He will not be damned. Tell him he can go in peace. And by the way, I changed my mind again also. He can join the monastery. <coughs> so the Lord is most stable in good. But he has a hard time being stable in punishment. He all, all we have to do is show the smallest repentance. And there it says in the Psalms. The psalm we read on, I believe it's Friday morning in the Matins. We get the number of the psalm. And it speaks, Psalm 77, speaks of the wickedness of the Jews. And the Jews were wicked, and he punished them, and they repented, and he forgave them. And they were wicked again, and he punished them, and he repented, and he forgave them. And they were wicked again, and they didn't repent, but they acted like they repented, and they faked it, and he forgave them anyway. And that's what the Holy Ghost tells us. We must, even if we fake repentance, he may took it. It says there in the Psalms, by the Holy Ghost, they faked their repentance. They did not mean to repent, but he took their fake repentance as if it was real, and therefore he forgave them. And this, in fact, is a type of the Holy Sacrament of Confession. When you go to confession, you're supposed to be perfectly sorry for your sins, but in fact we're not. And if we're not perfectly sorry for our sins, we should not be forgiven. Hence, when we go to confession, we have a fake repentance, like it's recorded in Psalm 77. But the Lord takes the fake repentance as though it is real repentance, and He wipes away our sins by the power of the sacrament of penance. <coughs> this is the nature of our God. <clears throat> we must remember to be aware of falling into the temptation of bitterness, 
and fall into the temptation of wanting vengeance upon our enemies. The way to get vengeance upon our enemies is to take them away from Satan. To bring them back to the divine love. To bring them back to the divine truth. And this is what we must do. There are many times, any time in the history of the world we can be in the army of Christ. But when is the best time? The best time is the night. In the day, it's a boring time to be in the army of Christ. But in the night, it was in the night that he rose from the dead. It's in the night that he died. Remember when he died at 3 p.m.? There came a great darkness. And darkness came in the middle of the day. It was in fact night. And he was born in the night. And all the magnificent things that have happened to souls, they happened in the night. And so then the night is, is, we call it the time of darkness, we call it the time of the devil, but it is a time in which the devil in fact is defeated, the time in which he's destroyed. And that's what St. Stephen knew in his very first sermon. He argued with him in the first part of the sermon. We don't have the words of his argument. He told them that they were wrong and, all their, and he defeated them. But we don't know all this defeated. But this has been repeated many times by the arguments of the deacons and priests and bishops and popes and the priests in the last 2,000 years against the heresies of their times. Many arguments have defeated them. But these arguments, they are forgotten with the heresies. But what remains? To see the Son of God stand in the right hand in power and majesty. To see the gates of heaven opened to see that those that have sinned and offended God, which is everyone except the Blessed Virgin Mary, to see that many of them have been called into the kingdom of heaven, and their, they have been, their sins have been forgotten. As far as east is from west, so far as God put our sins from us. This is the way of our good God. And hence, if we are wise, in the time of darkness, open your eyes and see the light. In the time of evil, open your eyes and heart and see the good. In the time of lies, see and love the truth. And then we will be faith, we will be protected by our Holy Mother the Church, protected by our Holy Mother in Heaven, protected by our Lord Jesus Christ, protected by the saints, and we have nothing to fear. And hence when the whole world shoots darts at us, and the whole world tries to destroy us, and the whole world tries to bring us before the judges and so on, we can have peace in our hearts. And repeat what the Scripture tells us about St. Stephen. This was the day he fell asleep. Generally, you find that there's loud noise and heavy traffic. You can't sleep. But Stephen slept with loud noise. He slept with stones hitting him in the head. He slept in the most great peace. And his peace is never taken away. And if we just simply follow the wisdom of St. Stephen, and the wisdom of the martyrs of the last 2,000 years, and the wisdom of our church, we will see with our eyes the beauty of our faith, the beauty of the truth, beauty of goodness, the wonder of God in all things, with all that's going to happen at the very end of times, when we look upon the whole history of the world, from the time in which Adam was created until the very end when Antichrist is slain and the world comes to an end and Christ comes back, we will simply see the goodness of God, the wonder of God, the magnificence of God, and how he has disposed all things well.